Good. Okay, guys. So, so this is uh, uh, okay. How does the story work? The story works in a very simple way. You'll be attending the lectures uh, being delivered by Professor De Borst and uh, by Professor Pippen tomorrow. But uh, according to our tradition, we don't want to kick you straight into these high spec, high level topics. Uh, so because you know. For some of you, fractional mechanics is uh, uh, bread and butter, but uh, maybe some uh, other people in this room are working on uh, uh, topics which are somehow related to fractional mechanics, but not exactly into fractional mechanics. So the goal here, and this is the reason why I was invited by uh, Francesco and company, is uh, to uh, give you the fundamental ideas about fractional mechanics, so we are, sure, we are sure that every one of you can make the most of the high level lectures that will be delivered by Professor uh, De Borst and Professor Pippen tomorrow. So, if you already know all these things, fine, I think that this is, you should end up uh, these uh, two lectures feeling very confident and say, yeah, I know all this stuff, which is good, and if you are familiar with this stuff, you you'll be able for sure to follow the lectures uh, uh, over the next two days in a very simple and straightforward way, okay? So don't expect that today, neither from me nor uh, from uh, Professor Berto, don't expect anything super high spec. Tomorrow and the day after tomorrow will be kicking you a lot, but today it's Sunday and uh, it's, the idea is uh, taking you into this uh, school in a very gentle way, okay? So having said that, the Let's start talking about fractional mechanics. So, okay. you give me something. Okay, that will work. Good. Good to know. Okay, so I, I'll be here. So, first question: What is a crack? Have you got an idea? This is very easy because this is a crack we see in a piece of metal. So you can see the the crack front here. You can uh, uh, see a little bit of necking here, uh, striations, uh, and this is a crack, very easy. So first of all, we need to say that even if we are dealing with a very simple material like a piece of steel, the shape of the crack can be uh, very complex and it's not a straightforward problem. So if you already know something about the Irwin's problem or Griffith's problem, you can already see from these simple examples that their models are really already far away from reality. And believe me, these are very simple cases. But a real crack actually is something much more complex because you've got a lot of mechanisms being involved. And this is what you can find in a process. These are, this is basically a summary of all the processes that uh, come into play when we have the initiation and the propagation of the crack. For instance, if you start it from the bottom, you can have bridging, bridging that is some fibers uh, preventing the crack from propagating. So some of you are working with composites. If you have fibers, this is a very common uh, case. But also, if you think about concrete, when you have uh, your reinforcement inside the concrete, again, you can have the reinforcement the playing that role. After that, you have a crack, which is basically a physical entity moving this way. So friction. It could be static, it could be fatigue, you could have external components. So certainly the friction you have here is very important. After that, you can have hard inclusions, you can have a, a plastic zone here, I have the crack, and the size of the plastic zone can change, the shape of the plastic zone can change. Here you can have uh, the formation of uh, bullets, uh, and also the crack, actually, in, in reality, cracks never propagate you know, following a straight or linear path. What you have is always a zigzag process, and in fact, Sometimes to see Griffith's crack, you really need to observe your problem from a certain distance because if you get very close to your crack, what you would notice is a zigzag path where the path, the morphology of the path, sorry, the direction of the path is characterized by or depends on the morphology of the material. So, really, we talk about fractional mechanics, but actually, sometimes we don't really know how to answer a very basic question. What is a crack? Okay, 
I'm sure that you guys have got a lot of uh, examples uh, confirming this uh, problem, especially if you work with high-spec, very complex materials. You mentioned biological materials. Cracking bones, even more complicated because bones react and uh, you have uh, self-repairing mechanisms which are not uh, depicted here. So you have uh, a material repairing itself. When I was a, a young PhD student like, like you, uh, my boss came to me saying, test these uh, uh, polymers was basically, uh, I was supposed to test uh, two adhesive joints. Uh, so the glue and the two plates, I ran my fatigue test, very happy, I generated my crack. I went home, leaving the samples on the table, I came back the day after and the crack was gone. It was August in Italy. It was a polymer. <laughs> Self healing. I was like, okay, <laughs> good, lesson learned. So, yeah, there are a lot of uh, uh, aspects uh, and, um, which are very important. So, first of all, when you tackle your problem, the very first question you need to ask yourself is what am I dealing with? Okay, what type of crack am I supposed to see? And we enter a field which is very, very important, which is what we call failure analysis, okay? So this is something you should think about. Observing the process. Before modeling, observe the process, because the cracking mechanisms are very, very complex. And my personal suggestion is, imagine that you have a, a little kid or a little brother, and your little brother is curious about the crack you are dealing with. Think about a way to explain to your reader brother what you are observing. If you can do it, so if you can break down your problem into a number of simple basic problems you can explain, then you can model those problems. If not, you could end up with a mathematical model making no sense at all. Okay? So we model reality, we don't play with the maths just for the sake of modeling, of using maths. Okay? And believe me, if you have a pro processes like this one, it's it can be very complicated, but hey, it's our job. Okay, so let's start uh, uh, saying, okay, let's assume that we want to somehow model our uh, crack. The first thing to do is uh, using the right tools. Of course, there are very sophisticated models, but what we do is assuming that always, at least when we talk about the fundamentals of fracture mechanics, is that we are dealing with a linear elastic body, so non-linearities. Be careful because in fracture mechanics, when we say linear elastic, we intend that the behavior, the stress strain response is linear. But when we talk about elastoplastic mechanics, actually we make an improper use of that definition because we should be saying fracture mechanics to model non-linearities. Because you can also use what we call elastoplastic fracture mechanics to model non-linearities which are not directly related to plasticity. Okay, so it's a quite reductive way to describe the problem. So the starting point of the model is assuming that you have a linear elastic behavior. If you have non-linearities, you enter a new field, and this is what we try to do at a very high spec, but to be honest with you, in situation of practical interest, still non-linearities are bad animals, nasty animals, and we don't really know how to treat them effective way. Okay? So, let's start uh, then talking about uh, fracture mechanics and what is the problem. So, we have here on this side, we have a geometrical feature where the characteristics is that the root radius is equal to zero. We call it crack. So, at this point, uh, we should say, okay, let's see, it's game over. Let's go to have a drink. Why is that? I mean, you should know what is the fundamental glitch in the model we use. Fracture mechanics. The problem is that a sharp crack doesn't exist, not even in a piece of glass. So, again, if we go back to ask yourself simple questions and give yourself simple answers, one should say, okay, thank you Griffith, but your model is really away from reality. Because we don't have in uh, real applications uh, sharp cracks. Now, if you zoom in enough, you will find a certain root radius. And why is that? Because the Latins used to say natura non facit saltus, that is, everything is continuum in nature. So, 
and this is what we have also at the craft tip. Maybe the root radius is very small, but it's always different from zero. So first, glitch in the theory. So if we assume that we have a sharp, uh, a sharp uh, stress concentrator. Okay, so if we assume that our body is linear elastic and we assume that, which is already a simplification, and we assume that our crack is sharp, what we get is the local stress field uh, diverges. So it's a singular, it goes to infinity. Okay, it's much better if we have a finite radius uh, notch because the corresponding stress concentration, or con uh, sorry, the corresponding stress field is characterized by a finite value for the elastic peak stress. Here it's very easy because we go back to the theory as formalized by Peterson and Neuber, so very easy, KT stress concentration factor, which is another big joke. Why is it a big joke? Come well, on guys, we are demolishing our fundamental theories now. This is the job today, to force you to do the thinking. Because our components are not based on specimens. And it's very nice to talk to engineers who are working on problems of practical interest. And they say, oh, yeah, fine, it's the net area, the gross area, force divided by area of the bicep. OK, good. Now we design an engine, please. And we have a problem there. Tell me where your net area is. So again, it's a very nice theory. We are very grateful to Peterson and Neuber, but in, nowadays we need something more. And this is why. Professor Berto, after me, will try to talk about the local approaches because we need to get rid of Neuber and Peterson because they are very good to understand but very bad to be used to, to design real components. Okay, so this is the problem we have. This is Griffith's problem. And so we know that it goes to infinity there. And we know that in the end, real materials, in any case, even if we assume that they are linear elastic, they are not. And uh, why can we still use a fracture mechanics? Why can in any case assume that we, our material is uh, elastoplastic, uh, sorry, linear elastic, and in any case we can still perform a decent uh, design no matter the field? Why is that? Because if you do a little bit of calculations and you consider that your sharp, your notch is sharp here and, uh, and you can easily do that using a commercial uh, FE code and you can uh, get uh, your sharp notch, you can uh, solve a linear elastic model, you can solve an elastoplastic model or you incorporate the non-linearities you like in the constitutive law of your component and in the end what you get is that uh, very close to the notch tip or the crack tip or whatever you want to call it tip your solution is bad in any case. But uh, no matter if you are using an elastoplastic model or a linear elastic model, they are both bad for different reasons. But actually, if you move a little bit away from the tip of your stress concentrator, uh, you see that in the end, overall, in general terms, using a lot of engineering pragmatism, there is no much, no big difference between the two fields here. So one could say, okay, fine, if the elastoplastic or non-linear stress field is very similar to the linear elastic one away from the <coughs> stress concentrator, why should I make my life so complicated? I can keep it using a linear elastic model. Fine. But this tells you something else here which is very important. All the classic theories, and in particular, I mean, not right now for very strange reasons, I work in the Department of Civil Engineering and um, Sometimes it's very tough to talk to my colleagues, uh, structural colleagues, because for them everything is nominal, and if you go local, it's at the tip of whatever you are considering. And for me it's like, I don't care what's going on there, because it's not uh, mini important at all. Because actually materials and components, really the structural integrity of components and material depends on what happens within a very specific area surrounding the, uh, your critical point. Because materials have, or the strength of materials is characterized by what we call a, a structural volume or a control volume. So the good thing, the good news is that we can simplify our life for two reasons. First of all, we can assume that with a crack is a sharp notch. 
So we, we uh, solve out that problem, so no root radius. And the second point is that we can make everything linear elastic because if we move away from the uh, stress concentrator or the, the, the critical point, that is, we consider the process zone. The difference between the nonlinear solution and the linear solution is so little in general that it can be neglected. And this is the reason why fraction mechanics has been so successful. Because all these simplifications are very clever. Does it make any sense? Are you with me? Okay, so this is what we are trying to do then, simplifying the problem uh, and making our life simple and efficient. Okay, when we talk about cracks, as you know, we have three possible uh, mode of loading. Uh, mode 1, opening. Mode 2, shearing this way. And mode 3, which is uh, anti-plane stress. So we'll be focusing our attention on mode 1 loading just because it's the most common case. But actually, because if we know this case, we can deal with these other two cases because the theory is exactly the same. Okay, this, the, the, the general architecture of the theory is exactly the same. Plus, there is another big advantage coming from our initial assumption that we are dealing with a linear elastic body. What is the big advantage? The big advantage is that if we can get the solution for this case, for this case, and for this case, and we have a component of subjective mixed mode loading, we can use the superposition principle. And we can use the superposition principle because we are assuming that the mechanical behavior of our material obeys a linear elastic constitutive law. Okay? So, having said that, we can go straight to Irwin's solution. Irwin's solution says that we are dealing with mode 1 loading. We are assuming that initially the gross stress, which is the force divided by the area where the crack is, but uh, determined by disregarding the presence of the, the crack, is uh, lower than 0 0.6 the yield stress if you are dealing with a conventional ductile material. Uh, and finally, sorry, if we are quite close to the tip of our uh, uh, crack. <coughs> so if all these conditions are short, what we can say is that the stress field around the tip of our bidimensional crack is described via these formulas where we can have also the complete solution for the plane stress case and plane straight case. So these are the equations you know, I suppose that you know are quite familiar with Irwin's solution. But what is the idea here? What is the clever idea here? which is a clever idea and it's a terrible idea. The clever idea is that no matter where you are around the point and the position of your point that depends on theta and r, all the stress components are proportional to the same quantity. So even if in theory we have a problem which can be in the uh, uh, you know, simplest situation, plane stress, bidimensional, or in the most complex situation that is tridimensional, it's, uh, I mean, it can have either two or three stress components, uh, which are different from zero, or three principal stresses, which are different from zero, two or three. Actually, all those quantities uh, depend on one single constant, K1. We know the name of the murder because the name of the murder is, uh, actually, mod 1 stress intensity factor, which is K1. K1 is an animal we like, but K1 is an animal I hate. Look at the dimensions here. What the heck is that? I spent the last 20, 22 years working on fracture mechanics, and still I cannot get my head around that, that quantity. Mega Pascal times the square root of meter. Sorry. It's a pressure times the square root of a length. It doesn't mean anything to me. And actually, the real problem is the way these equations were structured. We could have uh, rewritten this equation in a more clever way, coming out with a better definition for our quantity, k1, or for our constant, because it's a proportionality constant. But unfortunately, it's too late. We are too used to uh, this uh, definition. But from a physical point of view, don't even try. It doesn't exist. Uh, a physical meaning 
product. But at least when you uh, plug the number in, uh, you can understand what's going on there. It's the magnitude of the stress field around the crack tip, which is proportional to this uh, K1. Okay? So this is the, the uh, meaning, if you like, if you really need to find a meaning. Okay? So, clearly, if we have a look at these equations, there are some interesting things we can see. For instance, when theta is equal to zero, that is when we are moving along the crack by sector, you look at the terms here, and you see that sigma x become equal to, becomes equal to sigma y, become equal to k1 divided by the square root of 2 times pi to times r, tau x y is equal to zero, so what is good is that, as we were saying, and this is one way to visualize what's going on there, as k1 increases, the magnitude of the local stress fields increases. This is as far as we can go with k1. All the other stories you see or you find around it are just inventions, because everything was based on maths, and this is what they did. Not a clever definition. And for instance, if you uh, look around, there are some theories in life. Gradient elasticity, for instance, where they introduced the different uh, concepts and ideas. And rather than, in the end, rather than having K1, they, everything is reformulated uh, by referring to a length. So at least you have a quantity which is, uh, how can I say, meaningful from a physical point of view. Okay. so. Actually, if you have any questions or any comments, please don't hesitate to interrupt me. This is okay, so now we know that, that the main character of our uh, story, and sometimes our pantomime, is K1. So if we can calculate K1, we can define the entire stress field in the vicinity of the uh, crack tip, but actually we don't need to define the entire stress field because if we know K1, we know that everything is proportional to K1. So that's uh, the, the idea and uh, again if we uh, consider the stress distribution along the notch by sector, we can define K1 this way and this is the classic with the limit here, definition we use to, K, to determine K1 from FE models and this is, you know, a solution of the problem, but actually what we like the most when it comes to uh, engineering applications is this definition, which is the engineering definition for the stress intensity factor, where K1 is equal to alpha, which is the shape factor, times the gross stress, times the square root of pi, times the semi-length of the crack. Okay? So, if you are dealing with a non-conventional component, this is the definition you need to use to calculate your uh, stress intensity factor. And a similar definition applies <coughs> to the model 1 case as well as to the model 3 case. Clearly, you need to use a different stress component, but the idea is the same. And instead, this is the classic definition we use to do very simple calculations using fracture mechanics. Okay, so what's the story here? The story here is that, you know, if you have a conventional geometry like a plate containing a crack or a plate in tension containing a lateral crack or multiple cracks or whatever, you can find a lot of graphs like this one so which can be used to define your shape factor alpha. Okay, in the past the books with all these diagrams used to be uh, you know, very difficult to find and in any case very expensive but nowadays I think that uh, the internet is populated uh, with, this gra with the graphs like this one so it's very easy to find the stress intensity factors for a lot of geometries or in some other cases uh, we can find uh, the solutions for uh, the analytical solution for very specific uh, cases okay this is uh, the case of uh, a, a crack, uh, uh, sorry, a central crack in a plate. This is uh, the solution due to Featherstone, and this is the solution due to Irwin, the classic solution. And, or some other polynomial functions like this one, uh, which can be used to estimate the shape factor, for instance, in this case, when you have uh, two little cracks, uh, lateral cracks uh, loaded in uh, tension. There is no real meaning here 
because these are just polynomial functions which you know are used to uh, uh, interpolate the results. But question: since you you are working with fractional mechanics, what is alpha? Really, what? Why do we need a shape factor? based on this configuration, or Griffith's uh, crack plate, if you like, is based on the idea that you have a crack, a central crack, in an infinite plate loaded in tension. Okay? And this is a fraction mechanics that is based on that. But when you need to move to other configurations, for instance, when your crack becomes very, very long, so you can no longer assume that your plate is an infinite plate, for instance, you see that you need to correct your value. And the same applies to the other situations, or even more complex when you have a real component. So shape factor, the shape factor here, alpha, is a quantity you use to bring your specific problem back to the case of an infinite plate containing a central crack loaded in tension. OK? So it's a stratagem we use because when I have a very complex component, I don't know what to do. But when I have a crack in an infinite plate, that, hey, that's a bread and butter. I know I can do whatever I want. So what, via the shape factor, we bring our problem back to the configuration we know we can handle an infinite plate with a central crack. Okay? So fractional mechanics overall is a, a strange theory because I would say deriving Irwin's equation is laborious but not particularly difficult. It's all about assuming that your reference volume is in equilibrium. It's what we usually do in continuum mechanics. So it's, it's uh, laborious but not difficult. This is the reason why I, I, I decided not to go through that procedure. You have very complex formulas uh, which appear complex just because we need polynomial functions to get uh, these uh, quantities, but overall the maths which is behind fractional mechanics is very, very basic. And this is the reason why we can also easily implement uh, fractional mechanics in uh, epic codes uh, or, in, uh, or we can code our own very specific easy solvers. Okay? So that's the idea. So treat the fraction mechanics with respect, but uh, don't be scared. It's just a theory based on a lot of simplifications. And overall, the job is bringing back what we are doing, bringing what we are doing back to the problem of an infinite plate with a central crack. Because we all know how to treat that simple case. And this is what we do. OK? Good. And actually, this is doing a little bit of reverse engineering. It also helps when you have a complex com component trying to isolate your cracking process and trying to visualize your cracking process in an environment you know. Mentally, this is really what I do also when I do failure analysis. I try to picture the problem referring to geometries I know very well, like or either the, the crack in the, the central crack in a plate or two lateral cracks in a plate. And believe me, in the end, you are you can really, really understand a lot by always referring to these simple uh, cases. Okay? Is it clear? Am I killing fractional mechanics? No. Am I making it more human? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, good. This is the goal. <laughs> okay, so static assessment. We have the equations here. Here we have equation. We know that no matter where we are around the crack tip, all the, st the stress components so we can calculate are proportional to K1. We know that in engineering terms, so we can use this clever formula to calculate K1. So what we do is then observing that, and you can really see that, if uh, the nominal stress uh, increases, uh, given the geometry and the position of the crack, you have alpha. 
and also given the length of the crack, clearly K1 increases. But if, the, if K1 increases, then also the magnitude of the stress components increases. So clearly the idea is that whatever happens around the crack tip, and we know that we believe in a, in a process zone, so we are interested in understanding what is the process damaging the material in the vicinity of the crack tip. So if that stress field, uh, if K1 increases, the magnitude of that critical stress field increases. Well, so why not then using K1 to directly perform the static assessment. In particular, if we plot our stress field as we did before along the crack by sector, and as we incre increase the, uh, for instance, the nominal stress, K1 increases. But physically, at a certain point, at a certain point, at a certain point, your stress reach a critical value. The most complicated experiment ever. That's fracture mechanics. Overall, isn't it? And actually, this tells us another nice story. <laughs> Stress concentration phenomena. Do you remember talking to your little kid and or brother and explaining to him or sister to her what fracture mechanics is and what the stress concentration phenomenon is. This is it. This is the real complexity of the theory we are dealing with. Okay? So, keep it simple because we love simplicity and uh, you know, if we keep it simple we can understand a lot of things. So, in practice uh, the idea is that uh, when our K1 reaches a critical value then our piece of paper, the component the material fails. So Kc is in fracture mechanics the equivalent of the UTS in continuum mechanics. As simple as that. So if it's true, you know, you, you read the pages and pages and pages of theories, uh, ASTM suggestions, blah blah blah, they call Kc fracture toughness, but at the end of the day the design is nothing but being sure that your K1 is lower than Kc. The rest is a lot of blah 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 around this basic idea. Okay, all our respect to boring standard codes or boring recommendations, but at the end of the day, this is the idea. Your K1 must be lower than Kc, otherwise your component will fail. Again, as simple as that. Okay, and clearly, again, you can find zillions of different definitions, but if you divide Kc by the, K by the K1 value we're applying, you get your safety factor. Okay. As simple as that. Good. So, fracture toughness. So, beautiful. We have a, a very, a perfect theory, a very good theory, dealing with uh, a lot of things. We can visualize it. We know that in the end, we need to become familiar with one specific case, a crack at the center of an infinite plate. And if we play with the shape factor, we can do whatever we want. Plus, we can extend this approach to one more three and superposition three in principle we can bring everything together so clearly I'm not surprised that uh, we, you know over the, the last 50 60 years uh, fracture mechanics uh, has become such a big uh, important tool but uh, where's the problem the problem is that uh, we design components with something which is not a material property because the fracture toughness is not a material property Okay, it depends, we'll see it in a second, on the temperature, no surprise. All the mechanical properties of, of the materials we know change as the temperature changes. Uh, okay, it, it can depend on the environment in many different ways, it's different for different materials, but what is really shocking is that Kc depends on the thickness. And this is something really tricky, and this is where, you know, I, we understand that uh, overall our castle is made of sand. And why is that? Well, this is my personal interpretation. I think that it's quite accepted as a view. Okay, this is if we plot Kc, 
versus the thickness. First of all, we see is that uh, you know, we have a strange behavior here, but basically the fracture toughness decreases as uh, the thickness increases. And at a certain point, uh, the fracture toughness becomes uh, constant, uh, and we call that value K1C, which is the plane strain fracture toughness. And uh, according to the pertinent ASTM recommendation, if you have your KC value and your yield stress, and uh, for brittle material you can, materials you can replace uh, the yield stress with the UTS yield, <coughs> and you multiply uh, the square of this uh, ratio times 2.5, and uh, if your thickness is larger than this value, then according to the ISTM recommendations, you are in the plane strain condition. Why is that? Have you got any idea? Good. Let's try to understand why. Okay. I live in the UK, uh, and one of the things that we do in the UK, and actually I'm British now as well, so one of the things we do, we Brits, in the case Italian accent, do, is uh, basically eating crabby sandwiches. You know, it's terrible. You know, food in the UK is terrible. It really sucks compared to the weather. I mean, whether it's beautiful, but. Okay, so, and we eat sandwiches. And some of them are really terrible because you have a slice of bread, a slice of ham, and a slice of bread. Depressing, isn't it? Okay. So, if we start from a British sandwich and we, and we cut two bits laterally, as we did here for the piece of paper before, but this is now the sandwich, and we pull it just a little bit, what would you expect to see? The, the bread deforming a lot here around the tips of the two cuts. Can you see it? This is what we normally do. Can you picture that? Can you picture that? Why is that? Can you explain that phenomenon using fracture mechanics? I do. Because we start from the surface of the component, according to Irwin's, we can uh, define our local system of coordinates centered at the crack tip, and we are on the surface initially. These are the equations you know. By definition, we are on the surface, so our state of stress must be bidimensional. It's plane stress. It's the surface. Because if we had the stress component perpendicular to the surface, our piece of material would move around. Okay, so for sure, the stress state uh, characterizing the surface of my plate is bidimensional. Are you with me? Do you all agree with me? Good. Okay, this means that it's plain stress. This means that according to this uh, definition, the stress along asic Z is equal to zero. Okay, but uh, since uh, we can assume that, as we always do, that our slice of uh, British bread is uh, uh, biaxial. According to Irwin's uh, equation, the state of a strain on the surface is triaxial, isn't it? generalized equations. If uh, sigma x and sigma y are different from zero, and sigma z is equal to zero, okay, epsilon z x is different from zero, Sig epsilon y is different from zero, but also epsilon z is different from zero, because sigma z clearly is, is zero, but sigma x and sigma y are different from zero. And actually, epsilon z is uh, different from zero and negative, okay? So, positive, epsilon x, positive, epsilon y, negative, epsilon z, even if sigma z is equal to zero. So if we go back to our British sandwich here, this means that the, the stress, the deformation here, parallel to the axis z is negative. 
So this is the reason why when you pull the bread, we see that little valley in the vicinity of the cat. Okay? So it's a triaxial state of stress. You're laughing, right? Because you thought that fracture mechanics is something more elegant and difficult than the crappy sandwich, in British sandwich with the crap. This is what we are talking about, yeah. Okay? <laughs> no, basically I will see the British sandwich as more fascinating now, so... Okay, Ooh, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> good luck. You will die for starvation. Anyway, so, so this is, we can see that now, this, the epsilon z is negative here. This means that the, the thickness in the vicinity of the uh, crack tip here tends to get tends to get smaller and smaller. Okay. So let's move. So here we have a biaxial state of stress. Let's move to the mid section. The equations we know apply in any case. What we need to do is move into the mid plate here. Redefining our local system of coordinates, the red one, it's exactly the one you know, but now we are no longer on the surface, we are considering the mid plane, okay? But the tools we have are these ones, okay? And, but, at the same time, put it this way, we have the material pushing this way from the top and pushing that way from the bottom. So you want your crappy British sandwich, sandwich to be in equilibrium. So this means that the slice of ham at the center of your sandwich does not deform, isn't it? Because the thickness of the bread is the same on the two sides, and you are pulling it, the bread is deforming a little bit, and the slice of ham, for sure, because it's in equilibrium, must be straight again. From a physical point of view, being straight means that the deformation is by action, so we don't have a vertical movement. But according to Irwin's plane strain, epsilon x equal to, sorry, it's epsilon z equal to zero, means sigma z different from zero. So the state of stress at the mid section is triaxial. So the story is that on the surface, the state of stress is by action, and the state of stress instead at the, at the mid section is triaxial. No matter what criterion you use, you can use Tresca, Mises, uh, the first uh, principal strain. We know that, uh, given the magnitude of the stress components, a triaxial state of stress is always more damaging than a biaxial state of stress. Okay, so look at these equations. This is what we can calculate, uh, and uh, this is the, these are the stress components we can calculate using K1. But we need to form a further hypothesis in order to tell our model if we are either on the surface or at the mid section. But the model doesn't know anything. It's something we impose on the model externally, onto the model externally. So this is the reason why, in the end, Kc is not really a material property, because here, we have plane strain because uh, the, our plate is so thick that, uh, you know, at the, the midsection we have a fully developed triaxial state of stress, which is much more damaging than the biaxial state of stress we have on the surface. So, the overall, we need less energy to fracture our plate. Instead, when we go back uh, here, where the thickness is very, very, very small, in the end, what we have is that the thickness is so small, so the effect of the two surfaces prevail over the effect of the mid section. So we need more energy to fracture our plate because the state of stress really governing the phenomenon is by action. And clearly, moving from plane stress down to plane stress, plane strain, we have a kind of transition region which is very difficult to uh, consider. There are a few papers around, and you can see explaining this approach, where they did very accurate FE stress analysis. And basically, what you see is that 
you need to have a certain amount of material to be able to create a proper triaxial state of stress at the middle section of your plane. Okay? Also, so it all goes back to the problem of the stress analysis. And actually, it's not Irwin's fault, it's not Griffith's fault, it's in a way our fault. Because we forced to, uh, we use the theory outside of uh, its region of validity. But hey, we know it, we can handle it, and if we can determine the proper value for the fracture toughness according to the thickness we are designing, fine. If not, we refer to the plane strain fracture toughness simply because it's the lowest value we can determine from the fracture toughness. We can walk around the obstacle, but the problem is still there. We have a beautiful theory, which is very elegant, where one of the key mechanical properties <coughs> to design component, the strength, is not a mechanical property. But at the same time, put it this way, we are somehow used to this problem because when it comes to the conventional UTS, uh, ultimate tensile strength, we know that uh, the size effect and the scale effect uh, is a big issue. It's an unsolved problem. We know that the strength of the components uh, changes as the size of the components uh, themselves uh, vary. So, probably it's something we need to uh, deal with in any case, but it's a very, very extreme in, uh, uh, when it comes to fracture mechanics. Okay, so having said that, clearly, as we said, fracture, uh, the fracture toughness is different for different materials, no surprise, and also, as any, as we were saying, mechanical properties, fracture toughness depends on the temperature. Okay, I will show you a couple of other slides and after that we can have a short break and before moving to the fatigue issue very quick. Okay, it's a theory we love, it's a theory we like, but can we always use a fracture mechanics? Because I saw these mistakes being made many, many times. So this is the definition we know for K1 and according to fracture mechanics, failure takes place as soon as k1 becomes equal to kc. So, if we go back to the definition, we can say that there, is, there exists a value for the nominal gross stress, and we call it sigma f, given that crack and that shape factor, that makes k1, starting from this definition, equal to kc. So basically, you can read this formula given a, a type of loading and the length of the crack in the geometry configuration like I derive this formula by finding that value sigma f for the gross stress that makes k1 equal to kc okay this is another way to apply uh, or to see the fracture mechanics problem okay good so if it's true, and if we accept this formula, clearly we can simply rearrange that equation and we could say, according to fracture mechanics, my plate fails as soon as the nominal stress becomes equal to sigma f, where sigma f is kc divided by alpha, the square root of pi times a. Okay? So it's simply fracture mechanics revisited from a nominal stress perspective. Okay, I'm saying exactly the same things here. When K1 is equal to Kc, my plate breaks. If I use this formula for K1, this means that K1 must be equal to Kc. This means that K1 can be equal to Kc given my geometry and configuration only when sigma is equal to a certain factor value. By rearranging this equation, I can derive directly this quantity. So it's fracture mechanics told from the nominal stress angle or perspective. Okay, so uh, okay, what is the uh, the point here of the exercise in that I got rid of? It? The problem here is that uh, clearly, if now you use this formula. And for instance, uh, you assume, let's make it very easy. We have an infinite plate, so alpha is invariably equal to 1. We go back to the case we know. 
And now you're making your graph smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So if uh, A becomes uh, smaller and smaller, the failure stress becomes uh, larger and larger. And when the crack is very small, like a defect, according to this formula, your sigma f could become larger than the UTS. Or, according to fracture mechanics, when your defect is equal to zero, the strength is equal to infinity. Isn't it? Does it make any sense? No. So you must be careful because when you, you need to understand where you are, because real materials contain defects, small cracks. And it's very easy to fall into the trap and start thinking, yeah, I want to use fracture mechanics because I see these defects, which is not true. You might be in the regime where, actually, you, even if you are the defects there, fracture mechanics would give you a non-conservative estimate. OK? So be careful, because also this length can be very large. Cast iron, classic material, big spheres, and very poor cast iron. This, you must have uh, cracks which are larger than uh, 8 millimeters uh, sometimes uh, to be able to have uh, a crack which can be managed by using fracture mechanics. Okay? So the message is uh, don't, be, don't fall in love with this theory too much because there are a lot of limitations. And always check if your theory can be used because very often you see a defect and actually the defect is so small that you can keep addressing your problem using continuum mechanics. Okay? Does it make any sense? Good. The last interesting aspect is this one. So, assume that you have two plates. And uh, we have two infinite plates, so for both uh, alpha, the shape factor is invariably equal to 1. For the first plate, the crack length is 2 times a little a. We have a second plate where the crack length is uh, 2 times capital A, which is 4 times 2 little a. So it's 4 times bigger than the previous crack. Okay? Good. So. If we believe in the local approach, we would say that, sorry, we would say that, you know, both plates fail as soon as our local K1 becomes equal to Kc. Of course, the basic assumption is that these two plates are made of the same material and they have the same thickness. So this is what fraction mechanics is saying. Good. Okay, so if it's true, we can say that the sigma F1 then is the nominal gross stress resulting in static bridge of our plate, one having length two of the crack equal to two times a little a. And sigma F2 instead is the length of the uh, is the stress resulting in the breakage of plate two. We do our calculations, this is Kc for plate one. So Kc, clearly, when this condition is assured, is e sigma F1 times pi times A. It's the same length here. But uh, since the two plates uh, fi fail under the same value of Kc, Kc must be also equal to sigma F2 times uh, the square root of pi times 4A, simply because this is 4 times A. So I keep uh, playing with my equations, and I would end up that uh, Having that, in theory, I would say that uh, the small plate uh, is much, much stronger than the bigger plate in terms of nominal stresses. Why is that? It's uh, simply because of the way the theory works. And this tells you something which is beautiful in a way. Because and this tells you a lot about the mechanical behavior of materials. This is, uh, it's in theory, the nominal stress here is, no, it, it's in practice the nominal stress is larger uh, in case one, the, the failure nominal stress is larger for case one than uh, for case two. It's because this is what you need 
to be able to reach locally the same failure condition. This tells you that the failures are something very, very local. Very, very local. No matter the size of the component. You can have something which is very big, and if you do all your calculations, you could end up, in terms of nominal quantities, with something which is a little bit strange, like this one. It takes a, a little bit to get your head around, but it's simply based on the maths, so nothing difficult. But what this calculation says is that, actually, be careful, because no matter the size of your component, structural integrity depends on something which is very, very local. And in fact, in terms of local stresses, we can see something which is on local quantities, we can see something we believe in. Let's say, as soon as the material around your critical region reaches a critical configuration, my component fails. We believe in that. But it's much more difficult to say, actually, the small component is stronger than the bigger component. Why is that? I'm using the same material. Actually, it's not true. It's simply because we are tackling the problem from the wrong angle. Because locally, locally, the two components are equally strong, as we would expect. Okay, so again, be careful when you're playing with fracture mechanics, because you can find this kind of strange glitches <coughs> in the theory. But it is simply due to the way we play with the maths. Reality is this one. Fracture mechanics is not the perfect theory to explain that, but fracture mechanics is based on the, more the most powerful design concept we have. Local quantities, local strength, okay? And this is what really governs uh, the overall strength of our components and structures. Okay, so having said that, uh, we can take a short break before we start talking about fatigue.